Welcome back to the Trustone Era. This time, I'll be telling y'all about Edgermer in a folklore piece. If you ever wondered where I got the name Edgermer from, it stands for wanting to make a fantasy world. That's it. Nothing special about it. My imagination land put those letters together. I've made hundreds of places in my imagination land. Edgermer is another one of them, and it means on the edge of merriness. Created eons ago by four giant wisps. They simply floated to each other in the universe they were created in and talked for what seemed like seconds. Those seconds came to a group decision of making a new universe where the four of them hand out power to the people they create. All of their power eventually moved to universe hopping until there's nothing left. Current day and age, Edgemar is on its 23rd connection throughout their existence where they connect to another universe that contains intelligent species. This time, it happened to be humanoid. Their natural state of being is a wisp, because they were created by a wisp. Wisp being a small, thin, or twisted bunch, pieces, or flesh of variable amounts in the form of light. Touching them would mean you are literally touching an orb of light. Disregarding the color, wisp tend to be immortal until they feel like turning off the light. They naturally notice and naturally live however long they desire. Because they are all celestial beings that can survive in whatever gaseous space. The four original god wisp that created Edgemar are the following. The blue moon is named Bro, Triagro. The green moon is named Onomotorishiri. The red moon is named Ruzugu Goyer. The yellow moon is named Jacleo Tioras. Those four especially radical as they are, created Edgemar around 14 zillion years ago. Think about all that time and how this universe is a 23rd connection. In universes that don't live forever, they last for a long time. They cut off their connection with universes once the intelligent species dies out. All reasons are natural, regardless of whatever universe it is, but upon deaths, the four of them close off their universe until they find another one. Those time intervals are random, and during all of those times, the wisp will appear as wisp. Not the vessel formation or whatever universe they were connected to, or others from the distant past. With Edgemar being considered a fantasy world, it holds the beings of various magical creatures and monsters. Wisps are the top of the picking order, top of the totem pole, or whatever have you. All wisps pay a homage to the four moons because that's where they get their power from. The ones who pay the homage right gets more from the four moons. For instance, the current royal treaty is comprised of five thrones over all of the others, but the others adhere to the terms and conditions of their world peace, making Edgemar appear to be more peaceful than at war. Regardless of all of the people trying to tear the thrones down, they do that because they want their chance to rule. Nothing more, nothing less. There is no raping, but pillaging happens. Now, if you're asking yourself, how do they change from orbs of light to flesh bags over skeletons? Wonder no more. The four moons are of a countless age. They are omnipotent to the ultimate power, meaning their God and reality panels are maxed out. They can change the entirety of planet Edgemaria will and have before, depending on how much homage has been paid. Sacrifice meaning the operative word and no, wisp cannot sacrifice another wisp corpse. Because once they die, they disappear. They have to sacrifice living ones if they really want what they want. That has become the way of life for them. It was the way of life for Avosia, Masterpiece, Zova Sly, Rego Resilios, and Ricotto. The reasons why those five are the top of the food chain revolves around them sacrificing their entire lineage for power. That amount of power granted them with the means of upholding their version of peace with absolute power. Yes, they went around the giant planet, making sure everyone got toe the line with the new world order of peace. Because if you're going to sacrifice your entire lineage, however many there are, that's going to max out your God and reality panels. All the way. Cut to present day. It's still considered the most powerful homage payment to the four moons because it dealt with a lot of royals at that time. A lot. Five families worth, they had 60 lambs on their family trees. The orbs those family trees made made light brighter than 100 suns combined. There is no way to sacrifice enough wisp to equate one singular moon of Edgemar, but what they did was powerful enough to them to put them at the top for good. As the moons see it, 
They did something that the moons wanted. Therefore, awarded all kinds of omniscient powers. Avoja drinks all the time because she can snap right out of any haze. Handle surviving then restart her booze fest. She is one of the few rulers who holds daily audiences with anyone of any of the worlds. Also parties with them. And parties with them so hot damn more. Hasn't been in harm's way since the sacrifice. Masterpiece distributes power to all of her nation. Because if everyone is powerful, it won't get took. Good luck in their queendom. She distributes depending on who wants it the most, but for the ones who aren't natural warriors, still get power for their own protection. Zova Sly never sleeps because she wants to be the numero uno of handling all of the magical whales around Edgemere. Once a week at Derland, but scheduled around the entire planet for safety reasons, and the Arrow Ordnance Lords make sure they can be counted on too. Rego Resilios uses his omniscience as a means of buying his way out of anything, whether it be as simple as impending doom or to get rid of an annoying person. Either way it goes, the money he so-called generates is beyond infinite. Then there's Rakoto. Even though all of them are capable of this, he is the only one that has took two planets and turned them into a spaceship, fixing up a reality engine where he is now in control of two celestial beings just so he can hop around universes and do whatever it is he pleases. There's one who loves the people, one who protects the people, one who protects the powers, one who opens all to wealth, and one hunting for possible universes for Edgemere to connect with in the future. The moons didn't see that coming, but the moons loved them, so much because of their want for power that isn't a need. To elaborate on it, they didn't want a journey throughout existence that has pain in it. How they want to set up their world would decrease the value of war and decrease the value of taking a throne. With them altering the money system, the food system, where populations reside and countless other capacities are living throughout Edgemere, the moons understood that peace order. As far as they see it, this is the safest world peace treaty they have ever witnessed and know they do not control the population of Edgemere. They just keep the planet alive. The population does with the planet what they see fit. There's a lot that want to take all of their favoritism away. They can all feel it in their light. That the moons care more for this lineage of royalty than they have ever. It can get painful knowing that you either got to fit in or overpower them. But we have those that are working on a way to break their power. They are called the anti-throners. All of the characters that fit that description are... Dangerous, Fiffany Lozo, Walgan, Usir, Oranje, Sizico, Brayton Inferno, and Pormos. Others are with them. Negatoon, Glyce, and Indianapolis Jones. Yes, humans are very aware of the history of Edgemere, but all humans know they are just allowed to witness this universe. Now, if they can find a way to kill any of the five... They can disrupt the royalty order of Edgemere for good. While all super beings know, anything can fall. While the moons float and move around freely, they always know that what they do cannot be stopped. So they happily float around blessing humans with might they probably shouldn't because all of the anti-throners are looking for ways to bypass their power to royal flesh Edgemere. Who knows what will happen? We'll find out at 11. In the meantime, prepare for the stories of the pink level of characters. Well, the ones that are actually Edgemites. Avosia, 1,327 years of age, of Malaysian goddess descent, happens to be the most proud member of Ungai Rayon Achul. But then again, you would be puzzled by it because she rarely says her coven's name. They put in their time on the battlefields and have survived so much since year 718. When Avoja was born, it was high time during a hunt for covens. Hers was on the chopping block with several others, but Avoja had too many perfect allies in her back pocket. Her best friends, Rakoto, Masterpiece, Zofa Sly, and Rego Resilios, were cut from the same cloth. Brought into a world with so much power, any path you take would be entertaining. Avoja grew up with the following things inspiring her. Light, rhymes, the fragility of life, war, Weapons of mass creation, friendliness, catapults, elements, weather, elemental storms, gold, reality television, 
laughter to die for, and finally, hypnotism. Before massacring her whole family, hypnotism was a way to deal with actually doing it. What Avosia brought to her friend group was the magic needed to hypnotize any wisp of any caliber. You can say that when she learned what power was, she learned how to capitalize on it. You've been warned, and don't let anything vague take away from that warning. Queen of Zekri of Ejimir, and the Supreme of Ungai Rayon Achuhu. Her superpower is sorcery, categories of life, light, weather, and hypnotism. Masterpiece, 1,327 years old, of African goddess descent. All this time, if you've been wondering why I would name a character this and give her a shuriken in the shape of a puzzle piece, wonder no more. She's the one that puts things together, the mastermind behind the entire treaty. Her parents told her one thing, the same thing they told her siblings. There are a million ways and then some to acquire power. Learn them all so you can create the most power. Womp womp. Didn't know that would result in their deaths for a real good, great good. Masterpiece knew that the most ultimate sacrifice anyone can make would be of another living wisp. At the tender age of 13, she brought this idea up to the other four who were born in the year she was. Made a special place just so she could tell them about this master plan. Where they appeared was a top of puzzle made out of silver pieces. Looking at each one, they could see different family members. Then they were told an ultimate plan all four of them would give a thumbs up to. So it was settled. All of their family's magical might is living inside of the silver puzzle piece around her neck. Nowadays, she distributes that power to all of the citizens of her great queendom. She's the queen of ragers, of Edgemir. Superpower, Tetra. Categories, explosion, wind, flare, and light. Zova Sly, 1,327 years old, of Oriental Goddess Descent, of the Slyest Descent. Throughout the many worlds of the Crimson Collective, Zova Sly is exactly her code name. Where the hypnotism of Avosia failed, Zova picked up on the Sly. It takes great amount of intellect, strategy, and luck to get entire lineages in one spot. To get five in one spot, she volunteered a life of taking care of the magical whales. Doing this allowed her to understand the system of magical might all over Edgemere and its moons. Secrets upon secrets were shared with her friends, and those secrets, she developed a way to make friends while all of the wraith octopi around the oceans of Edgemere. There's an ode to a pirate ship forever appearing at any given time, but don't freak. While all the power this treaty has, they move with no animosity. Because Zova used to tell them when they were kids, when we acquire all of the power, there will be no need to fret. There will be no need to hate. There will be no need to kill. She was right, because all five of them do things that have made the current day of Edgemere the most high. Regardless of the anti-throner's existence, the paradise she turned Kanisha into will literally free your life. Queen of the Oceans in Kanisha of Edgemere. Superpower is Mirror Octopus. Rego Rasilios, 1,327 years old, of German God descent. He loves that he's deemed a comedian. Fucking around with humans has him the happiest and he loves to spread happiness. After learning everything about humanity, his favorite thing was to set holes free. Via giving them stacks upon stacks so they can get what they need. Because the money system in Edgemere is almost non-existent. It's like a culture that has everything so everyone rarely goes without until somebody wants to change the world for the worst. Looking at all of the history of Edgemere showed him that times where people said to hell with the money system was the most happy times. With there being happy times means there's less bloodshed and who doesn't want to go see what a new city is about without worrying about a terrorist attack. Please point Rego in the direction of those miserable people. He would gladly make sure that his enchanted stack of paper will quell rage as well as annoyances. I haven't talked a lick about his powers. Don't need to. He can bring astronomical powers anywhere he is and even in places he's not. So if his brows ever crunch, take the money he whips out because the last thing anyone needs to do is try him. He'll take everything of someone and place it out there somewhere to never be heard from again to the point they cannot be resurrected. 
for many decades. There has rarely been seen. The urban legend around him has Tokyo Diva talking so much shit, she ends up with a million dollars every time she sees him. One, annoyingly getting under his skin adds to his joke stash. Two, that will make you rich. He's the king of Ayanishlin of Ejimer. His superpower is astronomy. Rekoto, 1,327 years old, of African God descent, with a very strong journey gene, highly strong, ultimate difficulty strong. There was always something in his ears growing up, telling him he must see as much of everything as possible because there's no way of seeing everything possible. He learned about other universes and wanted to develop a plan to make that happen. He got lucky because the four kids that grew up with him helped him achieve it. The plans of powers were made and anyone that didn't go along with the hypnotism or the slightness was punched into it. Rakoto was lucky to be blessed with weather as a superpower, but it's his drive of seeing a multitude of universes that turned him into a one-man army before he turned into a man. Didn't let up on any of that aggression for a moment until the plan was a success. Started his lineage after making his universe tripping spaceship. It's been a tradition since. If he meets a woman that changes his mind, conception. He has seven kids now, but the amount of universes he has been to, nowhere near that amount. He's the king of Indias, the second Ejimer. Superpower is weather. On that note, Rakoto gave the old kingdom of Gomelos to a lineage of peace. They have been ruling Gomelos successfully for the last millennium even against all of the anti-throners. You can chalk that up to Roughhead's development. Onward to the youngest princess and princess of Edgemere. Before I give descriptions of how they be, I noticed something. I made six princes, all with superpowers that kind of go with each other. Hell, heaven, fire, water, earth, and afterlife. With the princess having a superpower of weather, it's a holy 70. Think about it as much as you need. Secondly, not all of the young royalty grew up with knights their age. Only Roughhead, Galtos, and Proof got lucky in that sense. Roughhead, 35 years old, of Panamanian God descent. He's the prince of Gomelos. He started off with so much innocence. His mother and father would teach him things of all natures because he was always and already trying things. From throwing a bunch of ingredients into a bowl to picking up after himself to running lawnmowers, to hanging up sigils, to the castle keep squad, in the intricate ways his father would get handsome for the day. He, at the age of five, thought his life is going to be perfect, so he always had an inkling in the back of his head reminding him to look for something for his parents. The exact moment he went on his first venture, took him many years until he found something that reminded him of his youth with his parents. It was on display with several other golden idols representing models of families. Lots of different combinations, but the one he chose was a randomized enchanted one. Something a lot of people try to buy from a specific shop. First time there, he chose one that was highly enchanted. With energies that give off a truly wholesome energy that can cure trauma in people. He didn't notice, but many Edgemites did. One of them was so desperate for one of the charm golden items that he harmed the child to get it. Ever since that day, Roughhead's head has been so rough, you can't knock him out with a Gundam punch. Unfortunate for him, the quest to find a perfect present to represent his parents procreating him is not finished. Prince of Gomelos of Edgemir, the secret weapon of the Vayashi Settlement Forces, a galactic class one-man army, gunman, Hero Helper, and the head of IMD Adventure Gaming. His superpower is hell. Huge side note, Sir Sworn is his first knight. Parents decided to procreate when the king and queen finally decided to. Sir Sworn is the captain of the Vayashi Settlement Forces, a galactic class one-man army hero and annihilation hero. His superpower is Laser Ladybug. Galtos. 32 years old, of German God descent. He's the third prince of Amarwat. This lineage decides their rulers depending on who has the most might of the siblings. You guessed the right, it's Galtos.
but his father is so far away from handing over the reins that he doesn't really care about it. What he does care about is being the state governor of Falcon State of America, Planet Z, holding down a leadership role with the utmost respect for mankind. Being a prince, a hero, and a politician keeps him booked and blessed. He doesn't mind. He was given gifts, and he plans on using them well. He said that, but he actually uses them Omega style. If you ever decide to take up villainy, you will probably be taken out by him, only because he knows majority of the heroes worldwide. What he brings to the table is strike first to finish first. Give him the group strategy, and he'll follow through as if he's beyond invulnerable. One of the bonuses of having him in your back pocket is Shavetha, his first knight and dame. They grew up together, fell in love together to whoop ass over villainy together. For a whole lifetime. He's the third prince of Amarwat of Edgemere, state governor of Falcon State, galactic class one-man army, and hero helper. His superpower is heaven. Shavetha is the first knight of Gatos, and she has the same hero credentials as him, as well as the same superpower. Crave. 27 years old, of Turkish god descent. He's the prince of Nymor, the land of ghouls, ghosts, and gotchas. You can learn a lot and be awarded a lot, because this land is friendly like that. Perhaps the most friendly land in Edgemere. It's oddly been dodging throne takeovers because all houses have an equal shot at ruling. His father plays no games with keeping the peace. He owes his peace to the current royal treaty. It's not a story about being a lackey. It's a story about the right amount of power. Everyone in Edgemere knows that the House of Izzat can get all the answers anyone needs, and all most people want are peacefully perfect lives. Ancestors will jump universes purposely so people can acquire the lives they ultimately desire. Even if the person is tyrannical, they will be pointed in the right direction so they can get their tyrant on. Crave understood the perfect life he was born into by the time he was five. The only thing he wanted was the best friend who happens to be a girl. Talk about buying a life. Drama enters his life at five just because his father wanted his son to be happy. With his disreality control, he was able to get Drama across his son's path normally. The product of them becoming best friends ended up being a duo of pure destruction. Crave is all of the calm before and after the storm. Drama is the storm. Either way, they keep each other level-headed because Crave can keep it cool, calm, and collected when handling rage, but him going into full rage is the thing all heroes want to avoid. Still, all the glory is what he's capable of. While Drama will see the off switch, then completely ignore it like it's a sun in the sky. Always at 100% primetime television. Because she goes from 0 to 100 as soon as she wakes up from sleep. Good luck. He's the Prince of Nymore of Edgemere, a galactic class spirit guide and hunter, one-man army hero and helper hero. His superpower is afterlife. Drama has the same occupations of him and the same powers. She is not considered one of his knights, but damn near almost completely acts like it. Volvesia, 31 years old, of African goddess descent. She's the seventh of Rakoto's offspring. All of the others are male. She is the princess of Indias. The only people that know are Rakoto's best friends and anyone she decides to tell. That's the kicker. She hasn't told a single person. Even her best frenemy, Sade. Posing as if she's an orphan her whole life. When in fact, she can talk to her father at any given time of the day because of the special item he gave her. She'll place the miniature black cunch shell in her palm, then squeeze until her father shows up or talks to her telepathically, even through universal walls. While her best frenemy was in fact an orphan, Volvisha helped her out majority of her life until they finally turned into enemies. The whole time, and even after, helping her actual bestie acquire all the power she ever wanted. These two are not peas in a pod. There are two wisps in the same book on the same page keeping it beautiful on and off the battlefield as well as in front of the cameras, both happily singing their hearts out over tracks and on stages, to being spokesmodels, hosts, and beauty icons, but they didn't alter her singing chops. Superpower is definitely wetter, but she'll make a storm of sounds too. 
She is the Princess of Indias, a performing and recording artist, galactic class mercenary, bounty huntress, and helper Valina. Her superpower is weather. Sade would act as her first knight if they weren't sworn enemies and if she knew. A galactic class one woman army Shiro, helper Shiro, spokes, hosting, catalog, runway, and high fashion model. Her superpower is weather. Crater, 27 years old, of Nubian god descent. He's the prince of Dyphon. His family says he's the most handsome dragon of their lineage. A lot of people would say that too. His scales are the greenest of greens and shine as if the sun is sitting under each one. Big green hybrid he be. A few years shy of turning into a complete dragon, but I don't think the world's are ready for all that handsome, bulky, hokey dragon to be in the skies. Stats have it that when he transforms into his hybrid form, anything in a way will be damaged. That's a testament to protecting who he wants to protect. The gaze. After witnessing atrocities of history, he devoted his life, at the age of nine, to become an ambassador for the gays. He's the head of a militia called Dravidigan, decked out in green dragon scale suits of armor as they go around collecting gays and guiding them to safe havens. Not really needed nowadays because of the way humanity is shaped, but in the memory of all of those hunted throughout time, he won't allow anyone to be hunted in this current day and age. You've been warned. He's the Prince of Dyphon, of Edgemer, leader of Dravidigan, galactic class swordsman, one-man army hero, and helper hero. His superpower is Earth Dragon. Proof, 34 years old, of Irish-German god descent. He's the Prince of Patrige, born the first of three phoenixes. Because of that remarkable day, the three of them were given the bumper to be raised as Arrow Ordnance Lords. A holy trinity of phoenixes could mean a lot of things. The queens of Patrige felt it would be best if the three of them were pitted with virtue as early as possible. The three of them are inseparable. They fell a bond. They were all born a few seconds apart, but as soon as all three of them let out their first cry, phoenixes all around Edgemere started to fly. To the castle of Patrige, thousands of phoenixes flew to sit on the walls or fly around in a lovely formation above the castle. Not ominous, but the queens took it as such. As their castle was kissed in the favor of phoenixes, without any doubt, the three children would grow up to belong to the mighty list. They were always ear to ear with their smiles when they met Bumper. They all considered him a father or a second father. The key behind it dealt with how Bumper never treated proof, zoism, or juicier different than any other cadet of the ordinance. Think about it. They were kids when they were put under his wing. Ordinance lords usually start in their late teens. He had these kids out there on every training session and all of the classes way ahead of time. Like a broken record, their parents told them their power is meant to be protected, not used for war. It's something all three of them believe, held in arms, hearing it back to back for three years straight, kept them straight on that path. He's the Prince of Patrige of Edgemer. Galactic class one-man army hero, annihilation hero, Gundam pilot, and helper hero. Superpower is Fire Phoenix. Zoism and Juicier have the same occupations as him, and they have the powers of Electric Phoenix and Vegetation Phoenix. Splashworth, 35 years old, of Dutch guide descent. He's the Prince of Wonderville. If you ever have a conversation with his parents, you will have a hard time wondering why they were so concerned about him. He came out not ready for the hard life of being a warrior, but it was his mother's father that simply worded him in the right direction. There will be a time where you will want to go everywhere. You will not be able to go anywhere if you don't know how to fight everywhere. He was preparing to move on to his next lifetime when he felt that a five-year-old Splashworth understood that he has to train so he can go everywhere. He simply died a few days later. A few years later, he would appear again as a spirit electric guitar. The Mega Universe goes not a single place without him because a spirit guitar powers him up and guides him. Been roaming around punching with the density of the deep blue sea since. Then he got lucky. Around the time he was 13, he met Zeus. 
best friend to be. And with him being an electricity wielder, their powers could do a lot for their ventures. Zeus happened to be more versed with being a super being than Splash were. So he asked them, have you ever considered buying your way out of fights? Bingo. Splashworth turned into the second Rego Resilios, would try his damnness to avoid fighting by unassing hella cash. But being around Zeus taught him about a lot more might, cause Zeus was the shoe in for him to meet all of the 1000 watch lists to be. Then he was placed on it himself. The Prince of Wondervale of Edgemere, Galactic Class Adventuring Board and Helper Hero. Zeus is the owner of Jackson News Broadcasting, and he's a Galactic Class Helper Hero who should really be a frontliner, but because of his connects, his primary job will always be relaying the news of the super incredibly correctly. His superpower is cyber. Onward to some of the elite protectors of Edgemere. Bumper, 777 years old, of African Inuit God descent, hails from the house of Rogeris. He is the numero uno Erero Ordnance Lord of Edgemere. A good 400 years ago, he was appointed the head position, regarding him as Heol, H-E-O-L, a coveted title by all of the aerologists who just want to study. Because he's massively protective, even in a real world, he skips no beats with making sure aerology isn't used beyond repair. Now the experimentalists who try to get away with being beyond godlike, they rarely see the light of day again. His license to kill is so superb, you might die from jealousy. Man has been known to Oren Ishii, an army of 8,000, by his lonesome to make sure a commander of darkness doesn't go through with their plans. He's so much of a one-man army, a lot of people say that if he was alive way back when, the yearly curses probably wouldn't have taken effect the way they did. Ruling that if you don't believe that Bumper is minding everyone's business, you're a whole idiot. No matter the lackey, no matter the boss, he'll matter everything right into a trash bin as if he's shooting a three-pointer from the sixth row of a classroom just to impress his mates. He may be all great in things, but that isn't his most proud accomplishment. He regards being the fastest gunner pilot of the Sea of Stars seriously. In order to save lives, gotta act hastily. Love saying it. It was one of the first things he said to the young, proof, zoism, and juicier. Is the reason why they hastily tried to develop their life-saving tactics at the tender ages of five. His Gundam is named Vestero. He's the ultimate class head Arrow Ordnance Lord of Edgemere. Galactic class one-man army hero, annihilation hero, and helper hero. His superpower is Matism. Shape Gundam. Element Sound Prayed up, 777 years old, of Arabian God descent, hailing from the house of Ersoy. Prayed up is one of the many coveted, protected, and sanctified historians of Edgemere, said to be awakened after every 100 years so he can record history for a few hundred years. During that period of 100 years, he's in a state of hyperbolic eight hours of sleep. At the current day and age, he will be awakened out of that cycle because of the alien invasion. When he's awake, he's living his code name that was created by humanoids who happen to be lyricists and poets. The way that he uses words usually sounds like prayers. Perk your ears right up with a voice that matches. Once he blesses people with a survival phrase, it's his uppercuts that make his code name so famous. Prayed Up is heavily connected to the humanoid superhero league that gave him his code name ages ago. The Order of Justice. Whenever he's within cycle, he tends to publicizing everything that has happened in Edgemere the past 300 years and supporting them. By supporting, I mean being a slayer of villainous kind. He never wants to wake up to a war. The possibilities for that are endless. He'll be roaming around the worlds whenever he can, but every waking moment is devoted to having an uninterrupted slumber. This will be the third time he is awake in his historian occupation cycle. An Edgemere historian, galactic class hero healer, helper hero, and strategist. His superpower is Kraft Ioban. And Iobans are wolves with wings. Throb, 124 years old, 
of African goddess descent, hailing from the house of Sovathan, a house known for procreating some of the most outrageous fortune goddesses. They didn't miss when Throb started to grow up. Always had a thing for the glitz and glamour of artists, any medium, any artist. Her favorite art happens to be street art, gallery art, and sculpture art. What fortune guys do with their power is giving instantaneous fortune to those that pay homage correctly. As Throb was growing up, she would get closer to her musings. When she saw tons of art that was to her liking, it would place her closer to the golden gold glow that shines from above. She was 17 when it happened, been swiping fingers across artists' signatures since, dropping one million worth, tax-free money of all kind to those that do her right. If you're asking yourself about her occupation, she's an Arrow Ordnance Lord, works not so heavily with Bumper, but has been trained by Bumper. All Ordnance Lords will have trained with him in some way, shape, or form. Bumper made it so that Throb would get her motorcycling skills where she desired, so she can fully automatic some turret guns while she controllably whips her action cycle around. High Echelon Fortune Goddess Galactic Class Arrow Ordnance Lord and the One Woman Army Shiro. Her superpower is Bloody Star Echidna. Isishim Noso, 300 years old, of Indian Goddess descent, hailing from the house of Zendifi, a whole house that has spent majority of their existence tending to adjusting to the clothing of humanity. From wisp to humanoid, they have been this Edgemere's main fashion designers. Isishim happened to be enthralled with guns, though. Barrel this, chamber dead, bullet here, magazine being dropped over there. Just blasting if she's been in tune with story number 19. Hella guns her entire life. Look at you. Did you pull up a mirror? I did. You can do it too. Moving along to some people, firearms, or masterpieces. For the mastering of them, the best form of bulleting is example through her. She has a particle cannon with a setup for grenade launching that will have you thinking, who the hell show her her first gun? Her favorite pastime involves executions, where criminals are hoisted up on a single pole with their hands chained to it behind their backs. There's a contraption around their heads that keeps them facing forward, and there Isis is with some of her gun ladies, getting ready to see who can two to their face through their eyes the fastest from 3,500 meters away. Usually, there are five rows of inmates, the ladies be five, side by side in a prone position with their snipers ready, making up a bet on who can toot to the face the fastest. The winner usually gets to choose the escorts for the night. Some weeks, they prison hop just for their kind of party. She's the fleet commander of the Barrel Goddesses, galactic class gunwoman, strategist, Gundam pilot, Shiro and Helper Shiro. Her superpower is Pollution. Supreme, 775 years old, of Italian-Brazilian goddess descent. She is the highest in echelon fortune goddess of Edgemere. Her specialty is providing perfect weapons and items to adventurers. You guessed right. The majority of the characters have met her through her marvelous life. Randomly posting up her mimic shop, where have you fallen in love with treasure chests you've never seen, only to get gifts you would never think of? She can still grant lineages great amount of luck and money, but she'll rather supply the worlds with entertainment, the battlefield kind. This super warrior has no loyalties to anyone, but also knows how to guard herself from everyone, even the top five of Edgemere. No bad blood with them, because she loves the peace as much as them but she can ward off anyone from attacking her at any given time because of her God and reality controlling panels. Until she wants to fight, she doesn't have to. What she lives for is a smile on teens' faces when they hold one of her items, then enjoys them walking away with it after they've paid. For is that payment to whatever charity closest by to where the mimic shop popped up at. Whenever you meet her, she'll let you hold something. But be prepared to glow, because this shiny thing will have you all inspired to the ultimate echelon. The highest in echelon, fortune goddess, and goddess. Galactic class one woman army, archaeologist, and the owner of the mimic shop. Her superpower is mimic ray.
Velvella, 35 years old, of Sudanese goddess descent. Hailing from the house of Mogo Maguri, she feels beyond blessed, having been born into a family about monsters. Long and lovely lineage that professes in the Indology like no other lineages throughout all of the worlds. They even scout other universes to add any type of monster to this world, vastly mind-hiving their way to monster nationalism. Just a plan of many they have in their back pockets. They live very peaceful lives because of that threat they never have to remind anyone of. Unfortunate for everyone, some grave instances push that protocol to a few of the branches of their tree. Sparking a few too many apocalypses, her and the monsterlings had to deal with many years back. Giganto and Cataclysm benefited from those apocalypses, though. Most of their superhero league did, too, to the point the monsterlings have no humanoid enemies. Out of an extremely high capacity, they have been the main group to deal with monsters on farming planets, so that they don't miss out on a species or a life form that could benefit the growth of humanity. It's a nasty world out there, but these monster handlers experience fear at a 0% capacity, even in obvious death-do-you-down scenarios. She's a Galactic-class one-woman army Shiro, strategist and helper Shiro, through the Monster Leagues. Her superpower is Shadow Iovan, and remember, it's the wolf with wings. Ramazan, 35 years old of Colombian Haitian god descent, hailing from the house of Wario, a blacksmithing and forging lineage that has the most favorable and conditioned spirit weapon making methods. They have been providing the sea of stars with forces that should remain alive for an eternity or so. Their state of being comes with genetic makeup that vortexes spirits to them, even against portergeist type spirits. All of the house of Wario knows how to control spirits. There's no way of telling when each character of the story got a spirit weapon from Ramazan, but his family has supplied a lot of the weapons that somehow ended up in his comrade's possession. What makes matters worse for villain kind revolves around how all of the Dark Lord Slayers of Edgemere have weapons that were developed eons ago by the Wario. Zap Fang's Hazarils, Nidus's Ethnus Order, Zoom's Storm Skipper, Pride's Creeping Gore, and Old Milagroso's Drenched Pain all belong to the craters of the Wario. Ramazan plans on upholding his family's legacy because it's one of the most ultimate ones. Just like his forefathers, he was always allowed to use any spear for his first weapon for himself. He chose Ev Mokai and put him in the form of a spirit scimitar. A lovely Massimune type blade made with the spirit of one of the Grand Chimeras of Edgemere. If you were to ask any aerologist about the grade of a spirit weapon, they would tell you that it's beyond Omega. Specially designed to cut through astronomy powers to the point he can develop a way to slash through suns and black holes to gone them. Warned. He's a galactic class blacksmith, forge master, and helper hero. His superpower is Shadow. Onward to the Dark Lord Slayers of Edgemere. Zooms. 30 years old, of Dutch guy descent, his parents thought he would be okay growing up on his own. It was a choice to make him an orphan. They covered their tracks incredibly good before leaving Edgemere for good. For their lives were orphan made too. The things they accomplished were on both sides of the proverbial fence. They left as legends but made sure their son wasn't connected to them. The only thing they left with him was a mock birth certificate. That's all he knows of himself. The Azure Acolytes took care of him per the wishes of the note that was left in his basket. The Azure Acolytes he stays with. Choosing them while fighting for them is what his life was. Now he's one of the ministers of the Coven. Title given to him after slaying so many dark lords. Been through heaven and hell to help keep the peace in Edgemere. Looking exactly like both of his parents, but still, to this day, no one knows who they are, but they would have been proud of him if their choices were different. A Volja masterpiece of a Sly and Ruggo Rosilios are hella proud of him. He's an Azure Acolyte adventuring and traveling blue mage. Galactic class hero and helper hero. His superpower is Magistry. With the categories of Diamond Dog, Light, Zenith, and Fire. Diamond Dogs are like Huskies with a horn that is made out of diamond. Like unicorns, but a dog. 
Old Miller Grosso, 35 years old, of Spanish descent, with dreams of being like Nathan Drake. All he ever wanted to do was venture into temples to see what they are really about. Blessed with a vessel that can warp in the flashbacks of highly enchanted places, helped him to see how life was eons ago. It's something he can't really talk about with other people because this ability is mad rare. He was simply in one of his trances one day in a temple in Edgemere, reclining on a set of stairs at the inner sanctum of it, while eyes that looked like they were full of clouds. He does that every time he flashbacks. During this time, Zooms walked in on him, and they had a conversation about it. But Zooms fell in love with how old's eyes looked while he was in a trance. Zooms was there on official business, and after O gave him the usual spell he gives everyone, he did a spell so he could witness what O witnessed. Doing this made the both of them feel each other's core intentions of being good guys. O Milagroso has been told to not fall in love with guys. All humans are told that before they go to Edgemere. But there they were, eyes full of clouds as they experienced the people that created the temple, the things that happened in the temple and how magical essence needs to be released routinely in this temple. It was an example that helped the both of them be better heroes. They were in their 20s when they first met, even though Zooms is famous, even in the real world. By association, Omela Grosso became famous too. He's the owner of Thingamajigos, the shop a galactic class archaeologist, swordsman, and helper hero. His superpower is magistry. Categories are sound, orbital, echidna, and keys. Pride, 30 years old, of African guy descent, hailing from Palace Paladin, born an orphan but scooped up by the right people, was his golden ticket through life. He was the first dark force wielder that has been added to the ranks of Palace Paladin a whole organization that goes to war for the Fifth Treaty. At the time they scooped him up, they allowed him to make choices while explaining to him the whole truth about their castle and what their name stands for. He liked it. He wanted to feel like he belonged. He wanted to feel needed, and he wanted a purpose. It was a family he wasn't expecting because eight years of living in the streets would change anyone for the worse. After his first week of being around all of those soldiers that never gave him a bad look, his entire perception of life changed for the better. Pryor was born shortly after. The monsters in his lineage started to be developed, and by the time his powers came in at puberty, he would be a star pupil to raise. With revenge for his parents' death on the horizon, he has been a dark lord slayer since, all because the good guys actually welcomed him. All that love that was created out of nothing at all helped out all of the worlds. He's the highest dangerous scout of Palace Paladin. A galactic class swordsman, one-man army hero, and helper hero. His superpower is Shadow. Nidus, 30 years old, of Russian guy descent, hailing from nowhere. As an orphaned baby, he somehow ended up in the Ethnist capital. One of their pediatricians got in touch with one of their aerologists, and there was some magic involved. Because his birth certificate was the truth, a sad truth. Two famous sword artists were taken without the ability of resurrection. He would grow up with an ugly truth, but his parents did him right. With all of their guide and reality panel intelligence, they made it so that he has a little bit of every renowned sword artist in his makeup. One of the government officials of Ethnus was smart enough to understand that part of his birth certificate because he knew how to read about his parents. Eventually, that adopted baby would grow up being a vigilante for Ethnus then further developed into Nidus. By the way of his father's guidance, Nidus would be around Edgemer picking up various swords and becoming a beacon of darkness that's against darkness. Cut to the current day and age, his fantasy powers are so huge, if you were airborne looking down to where he is, you can see waves of darkness lingering out for miles. That's how hard he slashes with any given sword. He's the guardian sword of Ethnus capital. Galactic class swordsman, one-man army hero, and helper hero. His superpower is fantasy. Zapfang, 27 years old, of Malaysian guy descent, hailing from the house of Wing Ku. He lived a lovely life out of El Savora, Zekri, one of the lands that forms a lot of the edible vegetation of Edgemere. Growing up a strong farmhand and diving all in for samurai training was a life he wanted to lead. 
He has always wanted to help with keeping the peace of Edgemere. He always wanted to be a Dark Lord Slayer, but it didn't happen for him until he came across the Vegas League, an organization within Edgemere that portrays themselves as a deck of cards. It was the King of Clubs that saw him when he was 13, tending to one of the many crops under his lineage's name and practicing swordsmanship, trying to do moon slash jumps from one disc pillar to the next leaping forward a good five feet while trying to get his sword to do a circle slash upwards five feet ten times. The king of clubs watched him do this over and over again for a whole hour, then told him what he needed to improve. It wasn't much. At that time, his samurai hood was oblivious to anyone else existing, but he was having trouble landing without having to rebalance. There were exercises young super beings could do to get their balancing better, he loved it and never showed any reluctance to the advice this stranger gave. The king of clubs watched him for another hour, watching Zap Fang do the exercise until his body gave up on him. Then watched him put the standing tall stone garden back to its untouched sandy state, raked the lines in a lovely pattern, then stretched before he went back to the farmhouse with a wagon full of greens. Long story, but the Vegas League saw the potential through the portal of sight and told the king of clubs that he'd fit right in. At this current day and age, he is the new king of clubs. Protector, as the king of clubs of the Vegas League. Galactic class swordsman, one-man army hero and helper hero. Superpower is Quasar Electric Sword Bug. Onward to the Anti-Throners. Walgen, 32 years old, of a Hungarian guy descent. Hailing from the house of Ogotum, this lad is one of those that holds down a spot on the do not fuck around and find out list. Been trying his damnness to be stronger than any other strength-bending Edgemite to have ever existed. Means it. It's in his core to be all high scores. You can catch him ruining spacecraft or in underground fighting rings. Sometimes he has to guise himself in order to do what he wants. His urban legend is mighty and futile. He spends his time paying attention to bulletin boards in hopes of coming across Galtos. Galtos has been in his crosshairs his entire life because of the feuds of the houses in Edgemere. He wants to be more than a ruler. He wants all of the yesteryears to lead up to him taking a throne. From all the times he started disrupting the peace in his youth, till nowadays, being a regular nuisance to all of hero kind, he will never stop until Amara White is back in the possession of the Ogotums. A galactic class monster hunter, tamer, slayer, one-man army villain, annihilation villain, and helper villain. Your superpower is hell. Sisiko, 30 years old, of Indian guy descent, hailing from the house of Quotal, a prestigious noble family that having a form of complete opposite. Sisiko was never having him, never wanted the sainthood. That prestigious lineage looks great across the map of Edgemere, but he is the combo breaker that is the ultimate difficulty of any video game. There's an unknown chip on his shoulder and sometimes wisp or born that way. Evil. Separated from the family magically and even looks different from them. Did this at the age of 13. He was traveling, Cavern Nikoto, a dangerous place to go, swarming with monsters of all kinds. They welcomed him by not messing with him. There was a warlock in there at that time. They weren't messing with him either. And the byproduct allowed Sisiko to walk through even though he was prepared to kill some monsters for training purposes. With none of them acting aggro, he just shrugged his shoulders and kept traveling through until he saw that warlock. He simply asked Detonate if he could change his vessel. Detonate asked him, what's in it for me? Sisiko answered with, I ask you first. Detonate laughed and laughed at the brave kid, only because he knows what the genetics of Quotal look like. Willingly giving up that specific look was very puzzling to an aged Detonate, been around all kinds of worlds but has never seen someone of a noble lineage go opposite. Then again, he has heard about one of their family members not fitting their mold, and this hasn't happened in their many millennia of existence. Detonate eventually asked him, What would you like to look like? Sisiko simply answered with, Evil. A hardened face he was rewarded with, 
hasn't returned to his family since, and they can't do anything to locate him because where his vessel changed meant that the call home feature of such godlike creatures was voided. Detonate eventually listed the names of all of the secret evil organizations home to Edgemere. Sisako chose the Diablo Circle. He's the Diablo Circle's main protector, galactic class swordsman, one-man army villain, and villain helper. Superpower is Quasar, Lightning, Trilobite. Brayton Air, 35 years old, of Swedish guide descent, hailing from the House of Nigun, one of the monster hunter lineages of Edgemere. Knowledge of all of the creatures that have existed in Edgemere is in their personal library. It's a luxurious looking library, one of the very few places of Edgemere enchanted by the moons. They love the lineage of Nigun. They have done a crazy amount of incredulous things when it comes to monsters. Exterminating the ones that have caused the most issues, bringing in new monsters, and collecting mad data on all of the species. Intelligence is mighty when it comes to this family, but they are of the neutral kind. They tend to do whatever they please, but mostly monster wrangling. Brayton Air aligns mostly with the anti-throners, mostly because he feels like his lineage should have a throne for all of the work they've done for Edgemere over the zillions of years. That kind of pride is dangerous. All of the things he has ever done has been in the name of being an heir. Following in his family footsteps when it comes to offense and defense has him labeled as one of the top threats of today, making their war against the current treaty very difficult for them to constantly defend. He gives props to all of the monsters he has saved through his life, to the monsters he has created through his life. His legion is dipped in gold for the sake of any throne. This all because of his astronomy powers. Created a black hole made out of gold. It's a gold hole. Whatever monster he dips in it will forever be under his control. Good luck. He's a universal monster hunter, galactic class one-man army warrior, and helper warrior. His superpower is astronomy. Oranje, 30 years old, a Mexican guy descent. His orphan situation is horrific. It's a good thing he doesn't remember any of it. A pack of wolves, zoanthrotypes, were simply on a killing spree. Went through a few villages before somebody stopped them. He was protected at the time. His parents were almost devoured whole. His mother made a quick sound and smell barrier so they wouldn't find him in the floorboards. As the barrier was finally fading, cleanup crews were coming to get the vessels and do their investigations. Sent to an orphanage, but he didn't stay there. By the time he was nine, he decided to go see the worlds on his own. Had enough magical might already to unleash devastating attacks and even kill attacks against monsters. He became a gypsy, essentially, jumping from city to city through being a young protector of caravans. He made a lot of impressions on a lot of people throughout Edgemer, but it was when he was 17 that an impression would make his life ultimately better. A caravan known as the Lost. All of them are orphans. All of them are powerful. All of them pitch in. All of them want to stay on a move. When he found out that everyone is an orphan, he felt that his life was complete. They did nothing but add to the amounts of danger the secret legion has. Pretending to be downtrodden, but they are as decorated as any of the round tables of the fifth treaty. All because of Oran Hay's natural swordsmanship. When all of the warriors of this legion started swapping techniques to improve themselves, it was the key to them becoming known. They weren't a secret anymore, because instead of moving throughout the shadows to get around to survive, they were out in the open, and all of the anti-throners rejoiced. If you ever see him standing out on a battlefield alone, his army of light will keep him company, whether you see it or not, and he will be the last thing you see. He's a slayer for the caravan of the lost, collected class swordsman, one-man army villain, and helper villain. His superpower is Crafty Tiger. Yusir, age 35, of Taiwanese descent. Hailing from the house of Zong, his existence is a puzzling one. He used to have it made when he was in a circle of Roughhead, but Roughhead never felt for him what he wanted. What he saw when Roughhead exposed his tenderness and care to Sir Sworn lit a fire under his ass. When Roughhead added echoes to his love realm, that made Yusir into an ultimate enemy. A nemesis, if you will. Even to the point 
you see us started making video games to compete with Roughhead in another similar capacity. Obsessions sometimes do us some good, but in his case, it's his purpose to ruin the nation of Gomelos for glory and to make Roughhead pay attention to him in ways he has always desired. The worst thing about this love-hate relationship revolves around you, sir, never taking an opportunity to end Roughhead. Because deep down, he wants Roughhead to tell him, I love you. He's not obsessed, he's suffering. But any time outside of Roughhead being on his mind, he is a pretty ultimate person. Congeniality awards across his entire life. But the second that Roughhead is brought up, he'll turn into that Debbie Downer. Galactic class one-man army villain, strategist, gunman, helper villain, and the head of Disaster Y Gaming. His superpower is heaven. Inferno, age 30, of African goddess descent. Hailing from the Black Gates, a whole Edgemere organization meant to always disrupt the peace. Throughout the zillions of years, they have been able to keep their locations a secret. All of them are dimensional pockets that they can move. They are labeled with a very random cardinal, a rather bright red one, somewhere on the ground where it's not supposed to be, with it never having enough enchants to be picked up on by godly sensing abilities. No one ever sees a bright red cardinal walking around on the ground. To activate the Black Gates, they have several cold phrases they have kept on Madlock over the years. All because, once you step in, you are in the shadow version of Edgemere. That's where all of the evil groupings, armies, legions, and organizations reside. Currently, Inferno is the head. They gave her the reins of the secrets when she was 22. Have been running around all of the worlds trying to find where the power is. She did. Nosy little self knows just how to use her powers. We'll summon a little hellified hummingbird and have it record everything in an atmosphere. It'd be so invisible from sensing capabilities that nothing ever knows it. Inferno is the sneakiest edgemite. The day she saw a bright red cardinal looking up at her and hella snakes 25 feet away indicated to her that she's about to discover a secret. It took her days to catch somebody out there, but there were two of her hummingbirds peeping everything. So she went to the bright red cardinal and said, I'm ready to run, not ready to hide. Immediately, the magic of this organization mags the surroundings as she instantly disappeared from sight. The black gates emerged and she walked through with the utmost bravery, then was held captive until she told them how she found them. Ever since then, they prepared her for great things as they told her many things of all of Edgemere's past. Things that are scattered throughout so many libraries and historians. Unlike them, she's been acting on those secrets. Head of the Black Gates. Galactic class one woman army Valina and helper Valina. Her superpower is Hell's Hummingbird. Dangerous. 35 years old. Of African Rican goddess descent. Hailing from the house of Senesis one of the houses of Edgemere that buys their time with saying yes, so they can claim a throne someday. Their desire to rule a nation is mad supreme, but dangerous, vowed at an early age that her life will be devoted to securing a throne. Her lineage aren't always connected to covens, but she saw the fruits in being a spellbinder, gave up her natural powers to acquire more and to develop her natural powers further. Joining the Tumbling Roses, when she was only seven and has been one of their prize mages since her coronation ceremony. For all of her spells are means of absolute protection because if you're covered in a 360 degree capacity, you don't have to worry about much. That's an ode to the enchants she made so the world's sharpest blades don't cut up her legs while being dangerous. The dangerous girl who spins like galaxies without ever getting dizzy. Reputation so deadly, guys that are hundreds of years old, are fucking afraid of her. You've been warned, even though she's passively biding her time with the hunt for a weapon to destroy the fifth treaty. No one else is in her crosshairs. You'll be safe as long as you don't put yourself in front of them. A tumbling rose is adventuring, traveling, white mage. Galactic class one woman army Valina and helper Valina. Her superpower is magistry, with the categories of dragon, diamond, sword, and ray. Tiffany Lozo, 35 years old, of Honduran goddess descent, 
unfortunate, beyond unfortunate circumstances made her into an orphan. Lucky for her, one of the dames of the Tumbling Roses took a chance on taking a baby that just came to the orphanage she was visiting. She coins it as one of her best decisions ever made because Fifany Lozo became a trusted underling to the fold of the Tumbling Roses. With no family to ever be with, she became family to all of the ladies and the bestie of Dangerous. They became two peas in a pod once Dangerous made it into their fold. Because their high beauty is something everyone admires, they abuse it whenever the other doesn't see it. It's the secret to how they acquire so much protection. Their quest with finding weapons to destroy the Fifth Treaty always grants them more protection. From universe hopping to temple hopping, they occasionally come across their doppelgangers and make quick use out of them. With the tumbling roses having more than their entire vessels in the arts and secrets of the universe, they developed a nifty spell of duplicity. Fifany Lozo and Dangerous have been blessed too many times by the elders of this coven because they believe they will be the combo breaker of the current peace treaty. To ensure that, they created a spell of duplicity that allows them to gain the strengths of the doppelgangers by simply hugging them. Women know how to keep it cute, right? A Tumbling Roses Adventuring Traveling Blue Mage Galactic Class 1 Woman Army Valina and Helper Valina Superpower is Magistry Categories are Power Fly, Light, Gravity, and Ice And onward to the last one Pormos, 1,008 years old Of Mexican God descent Hailing from the house of Ente Mayorel He is the last of his bloodline the reason why revolves around his undying wish of ending the Fifth Treaty. Born with a chip on his shoulder, creating hate out of nothing at all was natural to him. Even though he ominously existed for many years, he dodged hella head takeoffs. Just to live but further understanding the world turned into dodging head takeoffs indefinitely. Being around such luxury, such fantasy, such powers, such flavors, such ways of life, never took that chip off of his shoulder. He sees Edgemer as a crutch. He sees existing as a crutch. He's down in the deepest, darkest parts of evil's wishing well, constantly wishing niggas wouldn't, so everyone who wants to take a throne keeps their eyes on a prize. If more people were truly dedicated to setting Edgemer on a new even, he would have gracefully bowed out ages ago. Yet, he retains his status as the ultimate anti-throner. Who doesn't want a throne? He wants all of these pretty ass, handsome ass forts and castles abolished. All he wants to see is the lack of society, feeling like any intelligent species is a bane of every existence. Living is pain, and he'll be the last thing everyone experiences before the sweet release. The head of Diablero Coto, a Diablo Coto adventuring traveling red mage, Galactic Class One Man Army villain. Annihilation Villain and Sanctuary Villain. Superpower is Hexenry with the categories of Stegosaur, Poison, Manipulation, and Sun. Those are the Edgemites, citizens of a high fantasy world protected and developed by four omnipotent beings in the form of Wisp. Giant Wisp, a giant blue, green, red, and yellow Wisp rotating in multiple formations and going anywhere they damn well please. You've been informed. But here's the layout of how the nations are viewed. From west to east, Rager's, Masterpiece's Queendom, the Nation of Mirrors, symbol is two rectangles. Kanisha, Zova Sly's Queendom, the Nation of Wind, symbol is a five wind blade star. Dytvin, Galudo's Kingdom, the Father of Crater. The Nation of Earth. Symbol is a vine eye. Nymor. Hakan's Kingdom. The Father of Crave. The Nation of Spirits. Symbol is a smiley face on a coffin. Ayanishlin. Rego Resilio's Kingdom. The Nation of Stars. Symbol is an upside down solid star. Gomelos. Doric's Kingdom. Roughhead's Father. The Nation of Darkness, Hand from Below. Zekri, Avosha's Queendom, The Nation of Weather, Symbol is a Rainbow. 
Amar White, Quay Rock's Kingdom, the father of Galtos, the nation of light, symbol is a hand from above. Wonderville, Sosavi's Queendom, the mother of Splashworth, the nation of water, symbol is a Ripley Triangle. Patrige, Uranus Queendom, the mother of proof, the nation of fire, symbol is a spiky triangle. And Indius, Rekoto's Kingdom, Volvesia is his daughter, the nation of infinity. A bubbly infinity sign is the symbol. As a sacred law, no humans are allowed to step foot on the moons. The only people that are allowed are the beings of Ejimer. Say that human offsprings with a god. The offspring can step foot on a moon, but the parent may not. The moons have never allowed a species outside of Ejimer to step on them. Personal reasons by each, but it's their god complex. If they didn't make it, it cannot touch them unless they put themselves in human form. Their blessings are factual, and you may gain the power that the Edgemites have, but that's channeled through the color that may choose you. The other three are siphoning in to give a human the blessing of existence in Edgemere, but because they are chosen by one color, they are fortified under the color. Their blessings have different effects. They resemble the faces in a thumbnail. Blue keeps a human cool, calm, and collected. Green keeps a human alert at maximum, strategy-driven. Red keeps a human in a state of strength, rage-driven. And yellow keeps a human happy and satisfied. I'll leave this folklore piece with the list of characters the moons have blessed. Bro Triagro has blessed Izizel, Namasasum, Eliva, and O Milagroso. Ano Motorigiri has blessed Lux DeVoe, Ex and I, Super Spreader, and Tic Tac Toe. Rizzo Go Goyer has blessed Crisis, Camerakan, Dozer, and the Nigga in the Mask. And Joe Cleo Tiores has blessed Bazarin, Quality, Power Depot, and Vibrago. All of them have their special reasons for getting the blessings. Most of it is being in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. They receive their blessings for multiple reasons. Examples, being a generally kind person to the moons when they are in human form. A person's determination to make their dreams and goals a reality. Survival of the fittest and making a sacrifice to and for the moons. All great ways of getting their attention, but in reality, they are always paying attention. Because they are generally wisp when they appear in the sky, even the citizens of Edgemere can't tell if they are looking at them. They are highly entertained by the doings of Wisp and humans. Love the connection they have with this set of intelligent species. What the mix of these worlds do for them is simply unexplainable. It's as if they have a huge bucket of popcorn and a size 10 spaceship full of wine with them at all times. Watching everything from beyond multiple viewpoints so they don't miss out on new action. With the way these super beings use their powers, they expect this world connection to be their last. Infinity Universe, humans that have figured out immortality for a species and how they are getting ready to expand the humanoid spirit is beyond anything they have ever thought of. Because sometimes, they'll meet a human and feel like they wish their human was conceived in their world. Whenever they get the sentiment of never seen before, they bless their person. Now I must ask, are you a different person than everyone else? When Avosha, Masterpiece, Zova Sly, Rego Resilios, and Rakoto did what they did, the moons coined it as the best sacrifice yet. Their favorite sacrifice yet. The most powerful sacrifice as of yet. What they did turned Edgemere Bounds more powerful, and they don't even know it because the moons have been told them. What the moons know is that Edgemere, for the first time, has been pumping out more super beings, instilling in the moons that power comes from peace, more so than hate. They've been eating this treaty up for a good thousand years and want this kind of power to filter out more than a zillion years. Their favoritism is biased, but if you can impress them further than the fifth treaty, you will be paid handsomely or beautifully. Either way it goes, you'll know that you're a different person than everyone else. <laughs>